It's 50 years since uh, the UK went decimal. It was 10 years in the planning. Um, and so I'm going to talk you through some of the steps that led up to D-Day, 15th of February, 1971, tonight. Some of you may even uh, remember it. Um, I don't. I, I wasn't born. But there we go. So I'm just sharing my screen now. Hopefully you can see this. Here we go. Okay, so... So I said, 15th of February, 1971, the UK went decimal. Of course, it didn't just mean the introduction of new coins. It meant the withdrawal of the old currency. And this um, in case of you and seen it is, um, is what uh, some of it looked like. These are sort of the most popular denominations there. The, uh, the, the 10 bob notes, the 10 shillings, uh, two and sixpence, the... Um, Called half crown, um, shilling, and the penny. Um, of these, the ten shillings um, became effectively the fifty p coin. Um, ten shillings in nineteen seventy seventy one um, bought you uh, bought you a few things. It bought you two fish and chip dinners at a local at a, a little chef. Um, uh, a half crown bought you a pint with a little bit of change, a shilling. I'll go shilling by you. Sixpence um, would have bought you a bag of Maltesers, shilling a little bit more. Um, and a couple of these coins, as I said, were, were effectively translated into the new currency, so the shilling became the new fivepence coin. As for the penny, the penny was retained, but of course um, its value was changed, so it went from being worth 240 pence in the pound to being an even hundred. Now, this was significant because throughout its history, now it was due to sterling, there had always been 240 pence in the pound. And it's a really long history. And if we go back to the 11th century, we can see um, a monk named Brutforth, um, who was a sort of hagiographer and writer of textbooks, who was a teacher, really. He wrote in um, his Enchiridion, the manual, that there are 20 shillings in a pound, 12 times 20 pence is a pound. We didn't use those terms in Old English, so skillinger, pund, and penniger. So this unbroken relationship was retained until 1971, which is why it really was such a significant moment in the history of sterling, the history of the currency, indeed, um, in, in terms of, of British history and its, and its relationship to the, the currency. And, Sterling had always been defended by, uh, by monarchs as its value had been retained at, at sterling, as in you know, sterling silver. Um, that's 92.5% pure. Um, and for that reason, it, it had always been of concern to retain its value. It did different times. I mean, Henry VIII notoriously you know, devalued sterling to the point at which the um, the coins are practically worthless, and um, Elizabeth I had to reinvent it and recoin it by medicine she uh, herself at the time. So there had always been this sense, though, that, well, for, for at least 300 years, there been this sense that um, the system perhaps was needlessly complicated. It was inherited in part from the Roman currency system, denaria and solidus. Um, and so because of that complexity, there was, a, there was a, a gradual trend, especially with, I suppose, the rise of globalism in terms of you know, international trade, a sense of, well, actually, can we make it simpler? And there have been notable advocates, um, at least since the 17th century. Christopher Wren, for example, proposed a decimal currency at the end of the 17th century. There was a push towards a decimal currency um, from the 1840s. Um, a decimal association was formed in 1841 to agitate for change. And um, in 1853, it was led to a parliamentary commission um, to report and then a royal commission um, to look into the merits of a decimal currency. It reported in 1859 and came out against a decimal currency. Then in the 1860s, and this is a period in which the Latin Monetary Union, a sort of forerunner, if you like, to the, um, 
the European Monetary Union um, was formed, um, led by France, and they um, began to look at perhaps forming an international decimal currency that was based on the, uh, the franc as its unit. In 1867, a monetary conference was held in Paris. Uh, the master of the mint, a man named Thomas Graham, was invited to attend. Um, the government was reticent, but really rather out of politeness than genuine enthusiasm for the project. It, it dispatched Graham. Um, not realising that Graham was an enthusiast for a decimal coinage, and in preparation he had these coins um, produced by the Royal Mint. Um, they weren't intended for circulation, they're what collectors might term um, coinage. Um, so only very, very few um, were, were ever struck. Um, and you can see here what Graham's idea was. It was this fusion of the franc and the pound um, to create a, a monetary union, but that would have required the devaluation of, of gold, and being on the gold standard by about three, four percent. Um, but you can see on his coin, you know, on, on the back of the coin, he's got one franc, he's written down pence there, and that's how they'd be equivalent to one another. Um, and he came back and reported to um, the Parliament, um, which duly felt obliged to reconvene yet another royal commission. Um, but again, it poured, poured water from that. And then the, um, the the matter was sort of swept under the rug for a couple of generations until it was revived at the end of the First World War. Um, unsurprisingly, perhaps, the government found the public response to be pretty tepid, um, given that the, the, the it was recovering from the absolute horrors of the of the, of the, the trenches. Um, it's, it's completely unsurprising. And again, that Royal Commission came out against decimalisation. Um, it might have been swept under the rug for another couple of generations. And indeed, it was until after the Second World War when um, Lord Follick uh, introduced the Follick Bill in 1955. He was a Labour peer, um, and again, it proposed a decimal currency. Um, and that fell at the second reading. Um, and then we moved to 1960. Now, 1960, um, circumstances had changed. Notably, various member states of the Commonwealth had decided to go decimal. They include New Zealand, Australia, um, India, and South Africa. Um, and this sort of disengagement with the post-colonial project led the government into a period of soul searching. You know, to, or what would it do? You know, it's, it's, it's pound currency is, is being isolated on the, world, on the world stage. It was going to soon going to be the last country to remain decimal. Um, and this was followed by the appointment of Selwyn Lloyd, who was a Conservative Chancellor, and he was quite enthusiastic about decimalisation. And so he formed a working party, formed the various um, peoples from, for example, the, the Royal Mint and the Post Office, and they came out in favour. Decimalisation. On the back of that, he formed a committee of inquiry chaired by Lord Halsbury. Um, and basically, Selwyn Lloyd, by this time, this is 62, had decided that um, the UK was going to go decimal. So, what he wanted Halsbury to do was to report on um, the most expedient way to do that and the costs associated with it. And Halsbury's report was published in 1963. Um, this is a rather Oh, he did. Um, copy from the uh, from the Coins and Medals Library, but um, it's a thick, it's a thick book, and it, it set out in detail um, how um, how it was to decimalise. And there had been a split in the committee about whether um, a pound standard should be adopted or whether a ten shilling standard basically should um, the league currency be. Shilling, or should it be a pound? And in the end, they voted sixty-four, sorry, um, four to two, that um, that it should be it should be a pound um, with. I think actually they proposed a pound cent currency. The penny wasn't wasn't retained until the nineteen sixty-six. Um, and thereafter, um, they, the, the, the government had this report, and yet they just sat on it. They did nothing with it, and this was partly because of. Um, while term and um, oil basically. Um, Macmillan resigned in uh, 63, uh, then Ike Douglas Home came in, um, but he kind of saw the writing on the wall, he realised that the Conservatives were going to lose an election and then Labour won, but it was, um, it was a minority government and um, it wasn't until 66 that Labour government felt confident enough 
um, and they've got the splitting crisis out of the way, that they were able to consider decimalization. And, and this really came down to James Callahan, who was then Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he um, pushed Wilson into decimalization. And Wilson, um, famously, his response was, well, why not then? Um, at which point Callahan pushed forward with this. But I wish time, this is, this is March 66. Now, the Royal Mint have been aware of plans to decimalise ever since the formation and the appointment of the Halsbury Committee, and that was back in 62, and it hadn't been idly realised that it needed to be prepared, it needed to be ready in case of a public announcement. Um, they couldn't come in be handed to a cabinet meeting if, um, if the, the, the if cabinet wanted to see some sample coins. So in 62, it formed a secret competition where it called it the Teams Competition, where it formed three teams from leading art institutions and invited them to compete against one another. And the competition didn't quite end up that way. It became quite fragmented and the, the teams didn't always act as teams. In fact, it, it came down to individual members within those teams. The three teams were uh, one was formed by the Royal Institute of British Architects, Reba. Um, and there were just two members on that so-called team, one of whom was an architect whose name escapes me. The other one was um, the noted um, war artist, Edward Borden. The second team, um, this was a Royal Academy team, and this was formed by um, uh, Sir Charles Wheeler, who was president of the Royal Academy, and uh, Arnold Machin, um, who was head of sculpture at the Royal Academy, and William Macmillan, who was also associated with the Academy. Just three members on that team, probably because Sir Charles Wheeler himself had designs, had ideas that he might um, be taken on to design the coinage. So he kind of wanted to stifle the competition. Nevertheless, he did agree to put forward Macmillan and uh, Machin. And on the third team, um, this, this was a combined team formed by the Royal College of Arts, and the RCA, and the Royal Designers for Industry. So this was a combined RCA RDI team. And this was a team that only, that, well, this is the only team that really acted like one. Um, they, um, they bounced ideas off one another, they held minuted meetings, they quite well documented. And it was a team bursting with talent. Uh, people like Reynold Stone, the artist, Geoffrey Clark, and Bunny Sculpture. Um, and a man named Christopher Ironside, who was an artist designer. More on him in a moment. Now, um, coins have two sides, um, the heads and the tails. And early on, it, it, it was decided that actually, um, when it came to designing the decimal coinage, it wasn't necessary to have both sides of the coin designed by the same person. Um, as it sometimes happened in the past. So for the, uh, the heads, um, it was decided to update the portrait of the Queen. And so Lord Snowden was invited to take various portrait photos of the Queen, which he then circulated, which the Mint then circulated among various designers. Um, and a few um, artists emerged as favourites to produce the portrait of the Queen, Edward Borden being one, Christopher Ironside being another, and Arnold Machin being another. This was whittled then to just Arnold Machin and Christopher Ironside. And then um, eventually it was felt that um, Ironside's designs were a little bit stilted. What they'd had to do was produce a, a relief portrait in clay based just on these photos. Um, and um, Arnold Machin's um, was the one that was chosen. And he produced his portraits um, based on sittings, four sittings at Buckingham Palace. Um, um, and then he, he couldn't quite finish it off in time. So then he was invited up to Balmoral for a final sitting. Um, and he was then um, invited to a dinner where the, uh, it was announced that the Queen was expecting her you know, fourth child. Um, his autobiography recounts all these exchanges with the Queen, which are all quite interesting. Um, on one occasion, apparently, she asked his opinion on the artist Ellis Lowry. Um, and Machen realised that the Queen had quite a mischievous sense of humour, and he, um, um, he then he proceeded to hold forth on how much he hated Lowry and his, his figurative drawings, just terrible, and he had no skills 
thoughts and answers. But Iron Queen apparently just sat there listening with a faint smile on her face. And as he left, he asked a footman, you know, why, why would she ask about Larry? And the footman replied that she just bought one the week before. On another occasion, um, Prince Philip, more on him in a moment, Prince Philip came in and said, oh, he wants... He wants more on the chin. Um, so so Machin duly added uh, more 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 clay to the to the, the chin of the portrait. And then once he um Prince Philip had left the room, he quickly scraped it all off again, um, as the Queen remarked to her to utter delight. The reason I mentioned Prince Philip is because he was actually on a committee within the Royal Mint. So the Royal Mint Advisory Committee was effectively. The, the body that was organising all of this, it organised the competition, um, and it was comprised of various learned members of society, people, big names, but people who you might not recognise today, like John Betjeman, the poet, um, and of course, um, founder of the Victorian Society, Kenneth Clark, the art historian, um, but of course, uh, um, and as its president, um, it, was, it was Prince Philip, one of sort of many, committees that he sat on in his uh, lifelong contribution to public service. Tom, I'm sorry to interrupt. I Hello. just wanted to mention, um, I think the sound's a bit variable for people. Oh, um, no. I'm not sure if there's anything that you can do at your end. Um, I think some people are just finding it a little bit variable. I, I'm not sure if there's anything in at your end with the audio. Um, I talk louder? <laughs> uh, I, I can hear you quite loudly. I mean, perhaps a little bit more loudly, but uh, do, it, it might help a little bit. I think it just, right. it's, it seems quite loud to me. It just occasionally the sound seems to um, fade a bit. Oh, that's rubbish. Okay. Um, I mean, all I can do is, is try and talk loud. I, I should add to those of you listening that I can't actually see any of you. All I can see is the screen of my presentation, um, which is a bit, bit tedious. Um, so, yeah, by all means, do shout out if you can't um, hear me. Um, okay. If, if, it could if be any, the internet connection. Yes. No, I, I, am, I appreciate that. I think it's, it could be quite diff difficult, but... Um, let, let's see. So apologies to anybody if if you feel that you're missing anything. OK, well, so, I'll, so, uh, sorry to interrupt. But no, no, I'll, I'll press on and I'll talk as loudly as I can. Maybe those of you who can hear me, turn your volume down um, and I'll I'll endeavour to um, to speak as clearly as I can. Um, Machin, I should mention that so he, he was a um, he was a potteries man. He was born in Stoke and Trent. Um, he left during the Depression. Um, he worked. He'd been apprenticed at Minton, and he left for Crown Derby. Um, and then he accepted a scholarship to the Royal Academy. Um, so he went there, and then he ended up teaching sculpture. That's his career trajectory, um, and really culminated with this um, invitation to produce the portrait of the Queen. Um, this is a photo of him. You can see um, behind the framed portrait. Um, this isn't the portrait of the Queen used on the coinage. You might recognise it. It's the portrait used on the stamps. So uh, on the back of um, the success of um, his um, production of the portrait of the, of the Queen for the coinage, he was asked to produce the stamp and the, and the Queen was... Um, so satisfied with it that ever since she's actually resisted updating it, which is why the stamps um, retained the 1960s portrait, whereas the, the coinage has been updated on uh, subsequent occasions. Um, and here is, um, it's, this is the 68 10p, the 10 new pence coin, um, that was approved. Um, it was approved in 64. In 1966, his portrait appeared on the coinage of Australia, um, for the first time, um, and then in '68 um, it appeared on the, the new decimal um, five and ten pence coins as they were introduced. Now, for the reverse, um, it was a far more complicated process of development. Not least because um, there were five or six designs to work up, not just the single portrait of the Queen. 
For the development of the reverses, we turn to the, um, the work of the RCA RDI committee. As I said, it was bursting with talent. It came up with lots of interesting ideas and suggestions about how the, um, how the coinage might look. The most experimental of those were those of Geoffrey Clark. Um, so these are plaster models um, produced by Geoffrey Clark for the coinage. You can see it's, it's, I mean, it's quite, quite um, adventurous, really, the designs that he was producing. Um, if any of you have ever seen an Iron Age coin, then his portrait of the Queen um, is, is sort of reminiscent of, of that very, very stylized uh, design um, from, from Britain's first coinage. Um, and his intention was that all the information should be packed onto the reverse of the coin, so the date, the denomination, or everything, leaving the portrait to be as clean as possible. Um, he also asked about the possibility of making dish-shaped coins and having the information written on the edge of the coin, which again is quite, quite adventurous and actually foreshadowed the, um, the, the one pound coin when it was introduced in 1983 with its um, Decoset Tutamon, a declaration of safeguard written around the outside. The Royal Mint Advisory Committee decided that these were too adventurous and, and it didn't take them any further. Um, instead, it turned to the work of uh, another designer on the committee, um, and his name is Christopher Ironside. Um, unlike Machin, he came from an upper middle class background. He was educated at um, Bradfield College, although he had quite a hard time there, him and his brother Robin. Um, and then he, um, in the 50s, um, after a, a stint uh, working for various government ministries during the war, his career portfolio diversified. So he went into theatre set design um, and also medal making. You can see one of his medals um, for a council, it's a council medal in the background, this photo. And, um, and this meant that he was well placed in the early 60s to um, come to the attention, shall we say, of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee. And that's one of the reasons why I was asked to join the RCA RDI team. Um, and they liked his ideas. So again, it came down to a choice between him, Machin and Edward Borden. Machin's reverses were uh, rejected as unsuitable. Borden, it was felt that his designs were flattered by his superior skill as a draftsman, um, and um, but actually might look a bit stilted and a bit, um, a bit dry when made up into coinage. Uh, and Ironside's ideas were therefore um, taken forward. Um, and these are some of his early designs, I and mean, it, it gives you a sense of um, of how heraldry isn't necessarily codified until one sees it appear regularly. Um, so for example, his idea for the penny was to have um, the Order of Bath. Um, I defy anyone to, to, to remember what the Order of Bath looks like. Um, but then the, um, the lion pass on being on the five pence is a more recognizable symbol, recognizable of course now because we've seen it on the decimal coinage. Um, and on the 10 pence, he thought, well, perhaps we could have a seated Britannia um, royal crown and two pence, but um, he produced multiple ideas and these were gradually whittled down. So for this, he produced four sets, A, B, C, and D. Um, and and these, were, these were gradually whittled down to a single set of ideas. Um, and um, it was decided to put Britannia on the two pence. Um, and this was the, the, one of the designs that proved the hardest to develop particularly because you've got the large numeral two there and you can see how she sits sort of slightly awkwardly on this. Um, and he went through numerous sketches, numerous designs um, before settling on something that it was like. Um, and so while the, 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 the other coins were pretty much resolved by 1964, um, he was still working on the two pence and the 10 pence in, into 1966 when the government made its decision on uh, an announcement on decimalization. Um, 10 pence was to have a design for uh, George and the Dragon. Again, that dragged on. It was very difficult to, to, to get right. It's not least because um, George and the Dragon on the coinage had this complicated legacy. It was completely overshadowed by a man named Benedetto Pistrucci, who had designed um, the UK sovereign. Um, first introduced in 1817, is an iconic and very famous and very, very difficult to, um, to escape from um, when putting 
um, George and the Dragon on the coin, which is perhaps one of the reasons why it was eventually dropped. Um, and eventually, when the Royal Mint Advisory Committee, um, I should call them RMAC henceforth, um, once they were satisfied, what they did was have Ironside work up his uh, models, his, his ideas into these plastic um, models. Um, they're about the size of a side plate. Um, they're cast out, uh, they're molded out of um, plaster of Paris onto a sheet of uh, painted glass. So they have a very, very smooth surface. And then the engraver proceeds to carve into the surface to create the design. So they're basically working backwards, they're working you know, a mirror image of that design. Um, and then it gets molded again, take a cast of it. Um, and they keep working and going back and forth until they're happy with the design. And that gets us into an 18th century invention called a reducing machine, um, which, which reduces this down to a much smaller workable um, size, which is then plated um, and used as the model for striking the punches. Um, the punches used to make the dies, which then strike the coins. So it's a very complicated process. It's back and forth. Effectively, the designer's work finishes the production of this plaster model. He then gives this to the mint, and the mint does all the, the, the technical work after, after that. Um, so, a, plaster, a set of plaster models was worked up in 1966, hastily, I should add, following the surprise announcement by the government that decimalization was going to happen. Um, and they were shown to cabinet ministers in July of that year. Now, if this model uh, doesn't look familiar to any of you, then that would be because uh, the coin was never minted. Um, the problem was that when these coins were shown to government ministers, um, they uh, rejected them. They said um, that they weren't happy with them, they were too cluttered. Uh, memorably, one junior member of cabinet said that they were bad, fussy and old hat in a rather lengthy um, um, critique that he, that he sent to the Royal Mint. Uh, and so the Mint went back to the advisory board. At this point, uh, Prince Philip, who'd been working on this with the advisory committee and with Ironside for the last three years, considered resigning. Um, in the end, he wrote to the Chancellor and said, well, if you don't like them, then why don't we hold a public competition to design the, um, the reverses? And the government agreed. And so a public competition was announced. Um, and uh, the closing date was the almost impossibly tight deadline of January the 1st, 1967. Um, the problem with a public competition, and the Minted experiences before, was that the submissions that you get from the public usually aren't any good. Um, they're usually not of a quality that you can adequately turn into coinage. Um, and for this competition, it was it was written that um, it was stipulated that the um, the designer had to be capable of making their um, their sketches into plaster models. So again, it required a degree of skill um, in relief uh, modelling. Um, so that ruled out quite a, a lot of a lot of um, submissions straight away. And you can see the sort of difference in quality. So. An experienced designer called Paul Vince uh, submitted this um, idea for a 10 pence coin featuring Dunray reactor station. Um, whereas um, a submission from a Miss Dennis um, is a lot to, I suppose, you know, mildly cruder in its execution. It was never likely to, to really be taken any, any further forward, and both these were rejected. Um, when it came to judging the competition, again, judged by the RMAC, they decided that one set of designs stood out above any other, and they were those of Christopher Ironside. So Ironside, after having had his designs rejected, um, in despair, went, um, went back to the drawing board and from scratch created four new sets of designs. This is uh, set one, and um, you can see that they are a lot less a lot less cluttered, they're a lot, a lot more concise, they're clearer. Um, and um, as I said, he won the competition. Um, and already, even with these designs, you can see the makings of the coinage. So from set one, for example, you might recognise the, um, the Prince of Wales feathers on um, the two pence coin, which um, was indeed retained 
um, for the for the two prints coin. And likewise, on set two, if you look, you can see um, the portcullis of Parliament, which um, I inside at that stage um, thought that uh, it might be suitable for the for the half penny. Um, and the thistle of Scotland um, um, was to go on the five new pence, which indeed um, it was eventually used. For the 20 pence, you have this idea of a royal coat of arms, um, which was the first idea considered for the 50p coin in the end. Uh, more on that in a minute. Uh, and so, as I said, these, these designs were gradually whittled down into a single set of designs. This set here shows uh, this must be from um, sort of summer 1967. It shows um, the, the nearly, very nearly crystallized. So you can see that the portcullis has moved from the half penny to the one pence, um, one penny, sorry. Um, that was, that decision was made because the portcullis associated with Westminster in Parliament was felt to be a very significant design and therefore they didn't want to waste it on the half penny because they knew that inflation would probably render the half penny redundant um, within a couple of decades anyway. Indeed, it was withdrawn in 1984. Uh, and you can see here the 50 pence, we now know that the 50p was, is, is a seven-sided coin um, and they hadn't quite codified that yet. And the badge of Scotland, uh, the thistle, um, ended up being changed um, with the addition of a crown at the insistence of Prince Philip, who pointed out that if it was to be the badge of Scotland, then it needed to have a crown on top. Um, and uh, a few other changes were made. The tail of the lion was thickened, um, the base and, and things like that. Um, and then at that stage, um, it was time to work them up into plaster models. Um, and you see, again, you can see here, this is a model that, that Lance had worked on in reverse. Um, he preferred to work in reverse, but you can see here, um, interestingly, he's made a mistake. Even great designers um, uh, commit errors uh, sometimes. So at the, the top of the numeral one, he's, um, he's cut the, the slope the wrong way around, so he's had to recut it, at which point this plaster would be discarded. He'd have to go to the previous plaster to keep working on it. So to the 50p. Um, this is um, this was the original idea for the 50p coin featuring the royal coat of arms. Um, this coin itself actually is um, was was given a blated issue in 19, in 2013 on the centenary of Ironside's um, birth, um, but it wasn't issued in um, in 1969 um, because. When the other coins were announced, so the 10, the 5, the 2, the 1, and the half P, there was a bit of an outcry about the fact that Britannia, um, which had been a mainstay of the coinage since the 1670s, um, was not to be retained on the coinage. So the Mint, um, although it hadn't announced the 50p yet, it realised it need to go back to the drawing board and work up a design featuring Britannia. Now, I mentioned that Ironside had had such difficulties in, in, in the early 60s with his models for Britannia. Now, he'd done a, um, a submission for the design competition um, with a coin, so it was an idea for a 20p feature in Britannia. And again, this had been extremely hard to perfect. Um, in the end, he had his wife, Jean, pose as Britannia um holding a ruler instead of a trident I'm not quite sure what they substituted for the lion um and it was based on these drawings that he was able to work up a design which he then adapted for the 50p um and this is his submission um for that coin um and the rmac said no 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 that won't do at all it's it's, it's wrong you need to completely re rework it she looks stilted and all the rest of this the lion doesn't look right but we're happy with this um, so Ironside went away and he came back with this uh, and the RMAC said, yeah, this is looking much better, great, yeah, you still need to work on it though. So Ironside went away and basically went back to his original drawing and uh, went over it in pen and came back with this, um, at which point the RMAC said, we love it, great, let's, let's look into making this. There were problems because the die kept splitting, so in the end they went to a French company um, to produce um, much harder steel dies, which would withstand the production of this complicated side. It's um, known as a trochoid heptagon. So when you look at it, the sides aren't actually straight, they're slightly curved. 
Um, this was developed by Armstrong Sidley, an engine maker, um, because the Royal Mint went to them with a brief saying this coin needs to be able to roll down slopes in slot machines and not get stuck. And this is what they came up with. Uh, and when it was uh, introduced, uh, there was outrage. Um, um, mostly because um, people confuse them um, or claim to confuse them with the 10p coin, which was the same size um, as the 50p coin. And so they claim to have been shortchanged, although of the 600 letters of complaint, only 28 claim to have lost money as a result of this. Nevertheless, um, the Times um, called the coin a monstrosity and it led to a debate in Parliament um, about this. Um, so it, but it was introduced in October, approval rating went down to 20 something percent, but then over the next few months it shot back up again to 54 percent, 72 percent, and effectively the Royal Mint stayed quiet through this and was able to um, ride out the storm. Um, and so these are the coins as they were issued. So to recap, um, the first coins issued were the 10 and 5 pence because they were exchangeable with the uh, 1 and 2 shilling coins, um, so they circulated alongside one another. Uh, then came the 50p, which uh, circulated in place of the 10 bob note in 1969. And then the copper coins were introduced on uh, D-Day, on 15th of February 1971. Um, this staggered change enabled um, the mint to cope with, with production. Nevertheless, um, in the early 60s, it was operating out of very, very cramped facilities um, on Tower Hill. Um, and they decided to, the, to produce the, um, the decimal coins, um, the estimated 4 billion that required, they were going to have to move. Um, fortunately, um, there was a government dispersal policy which allowed um, um, organizations to move out of London to deprived areas and a few areas were considered Scotland, Washington, um, um, North England and um, Lantricent in South Wales um, and Lantricent was eventually selected not least um, because like Callaghan, it was near Callaghan's uh, constituents and this is the new facility as it opened in 1968, and, and it was um, it, it finished off the, the decimal production. Um, it had been produced at the the department in London, um, and the mint re uh, remains in um, in, in Lantricent to this day. Um, it has a very very um, good museum. Um, if you have a chance to visit it. So to oversee the change. Um, the government appointed a decimal currency board chaired by this man, uh, Lord Fisk, Bill Fisk, um, who had been, um, he, he, he been a councillor on uh, the Greater London Council um, um, and held various positions before he was appointed to the DCB. Now, the DCB had a staff of about 50 um, and operated out of a, a small office in Whitehall. Um, and it was responsible for overseeing the change, implementing and, and, and sort of introducing the marketing um, campaign. Um, and it advised businesses and organisations on the introduction of the decimal currency, although um, it delegated perhaps more than it, it led in that respect. Um, it was responsible for a huge poster campaign. Um, these posters um, were all printed and appeared in every single post office in the UK. Um, and it printed Your Guide to Decimal Money. This is the Welsh edition. Um, and this was posted to every UK household. Slight issue, of course, in that, in that the ECB um, couldn't control who read it or indeed how many times. Um, and it also acts um, as advisor on um, various um, media initiatives. Um, decimal points being broadcast on the BBC and on the ITV half hour film starring Doris Hare from On the Buses, Granny Gets the Point. Um, she starts off sceptical, needs to say, by the end of it, she knows all about decimal currency and she's able to teach her young granddaughter um, all about the new coins. Uh, the main issue that the DCB had to contend with was the Save Our Sixpence campaign. Sixpence being quite a popular coin, it was used in a lot of coin machines on public transport. Um, and 
I mentioned earlier about the shilling system. Had a shilling system been introduced um, instead of the pound, it would have fitted quite comfortably in the coinage. Worth, I think, there would have been worth five pence. Um, under a pound system, pound pence system, um, its conversion came to two and a half pence. So not not completely nuts, but but you know, not a bit a bit awkward, shall we say? Um, um, and Nevertheless, because of its popularity, particularly among um, sort of older older users, um, there was a campaign launched to save it. Now, far from sort of trying to suppress this, the government actually sort of semi encouraged it because they realised there would be quite a lot of resistance to decimalisation. But if it could be channelled and controlled through something like the Save Our Sixpence campaign, then it actually might deflect a lot of the criticism onto something that's relatively benign. In the end, the government capitulated. It said, OK, we're willing to consider it. Um, but all it did was to say, well, OK, the, the sixpence can remain legal tender after 1971. Um, but actually, what, what that did was to simply thrust the... Um, the, the decision onto the public. If the public stopped using the sixpence, then um, then they'd make the decision for the government and the government could quietly withdraw it. And that's exactly what happened. It completely fell out of use very quickly after 71. Uh, and then it was withdrawn um, to um, mainly to, to take back its, its mineral content um, by Thatcher in 84, I think. Then there was this small matter of the UK 600,000 cash registers to convert and teams worked round the clock um, between December and October 1971 to convert all the cash registers. This is a Swedish cash register. Um, it was already part converted, so this was made in 1960 and um, it just required the replacement of part of its um, keyboard and the flip was switched and converted. But older machines had to be taken to bits basically and be rebuilt that cost about 30 to 40 pounds um whereas new machines cost in the region of 100 pounds and most certainly small retailers went for that option and um retailers themselves had to get ready so sainsbury's opened a decimal store in croydon in 1969 um which acted as a training store for um, some of its 35,000 strong staff um, and so to D-Day. Now, Lord Fisk famously predicted that D-Day would be the non-event of 1971. And by and large, he was right. Um, banks had closed four days before um, to give them time to take the um, delivery of the new coins and also to change all of the accounts over uh, and clear all checks in time for D-Day. Um, a, a procedure which was nicknamed Operation Checkpoint. Um, so this is the front page of the Daily Mirror. Um, Bill Fisk was very active on D-Day, D-Day being a grey, drizzly February day, really. Although most retailers noticed that there was a slight increase in shoppers, um, um, presumably as a, as a result of them wanting to try out the new coinage. Uh, Bill Fisk toured around various places. He went to Harrods, where he met Decimal Penny, um, who were shop assistants, uh, like this lady here, um, dressed in order to assist customers and it was really you know through the these training programs you know places like Woolworths and Tesco the big retailers that you know, employed extra staff in order to oversee this which meant um the decimalization was the um the success that we that we now know it to be um that brings me um to the end of my talk just to say that if you like what you heard then um there is a book um, making change. Um, there may be an exhibition. Um, we, we are in strange times, um, but the, 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 the aim is to have an exhibition at the British Museum. Um, it's supposed to open in February. Um, obviously, that hasn't happened, um, but do check the website um, for, for reopening. Um, all I have to say is thank you very much for listening, and I'm um, going to exit this now and take questions. Thank you very much, Tom, for...